The views and opinions expressed by contributors on the Spoon River Gothic podcast are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the host. Material heard on the Spoon River Gothic podcast is intended for adult listeners. This podcast deals with mature topics that may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. This is Spoon River Gothic, narrative of a double homicide, part two. Hello, no one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. Chapter 20 Wake Me With the Morning Light She looked back at us from the door, and I had the last impression of that beautiful, haunted face, the startled eyes, and the drawn mouth. Then she was gone. The Return of Sherlock Holmes, 1905 The philosophy of search for truth is the study of reality, which seeks to understand the nature of truth and the ways to discover it. It is concerned with discovering what is real and permanent rather than what is fleeting or illusory. Thus, it is the investigator's duty, his creed to fervently seek truth, yet without temptation, corruption, or dereliction of duty. For example, the Illinois State Police was founded on the motto of integrity, service, and pride, and the ATF, professionalism, honesty, integrity, accountability, ethical behavior, and excellence. And on January 17, 1993, Illinois State Police Special Agent Kenneth Ketzer and Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Investigator Gary Smith had converged on the small, downstate town to bestow these virtues upon the home of David Haynes and to gather information concerning the deaths of Donna Tompkins and her daughter, Justine. The interview began at 12.55 p.m. in a two-story limestone apartment building on North 2nd Avenue, just a half block from the David W. O'Brien Public Safety Building, inhabited by the police department on the south end and fire on the north named in honor of an assistant police chief and two-year veteran on the force, who was shot and killed in 1923 by an army deserter armed with two 30 caliber 10-shot Lugers, who had been wanted on bank and train robbery charges. The corner lot, adorned by bare-limbed maple trees, which fill out generously in the summer sun about a green lawn, now dried and yellowed, buried beneath a half foot of snow. That half block to the south, seated across the kitchen table in a crowded apartment, stuffy with furnace dried air, 
David told investigators that Donna and Justine were really close to him, stating that Donna was his right hand and knew him very well. Adding that just last Friday, January 8th, Donna had thrown her arms around him and given him a hug, saying she loved him. David responded to the officer's raised brow and hastily scribbling by explaining that Donna had done so after he had helped her with a tax question she had had. Investigators asked David to pause right there and back up a bit, asking when and how he had first met Donna before her becoming a secretary at the National Bank of Canton. Before becoming his secretary at the National Bank of Canton, David stated that he had actually met Donna at the community bank the first day he had found a job in Canton. He said he was fresh out of law school, stating in his markedly hurried pace of speech, I didn't have a dime in my pocket. And when I first met Donna, I knew right away she was the cutest girl in town. David told investigators that after the community bank closed, Donna came to him and asked if he would hire her and that she'd been his right hand ever since. He said that Donna tried to be very professional, disciplined, and had morals, and that she was due for a raise, but for some reason he hadn't given it to her yet, but that she had received a year-end bonus the Friday she had returned from Connecticut, which would have been New Year's Day. Donna was always worried about money, David said. It was always on her mind. He and Donna didn't really socialize outside of the bank, David claimed, before recanting. Well, maybe every once in a while, but seeing that she was, well, we were both married, you know? We didn't want to be too close, adding that his wife was a little jealous of Donna. He said that Donna was under a lot of pressure with her marriage, and after her mother died, soon after is when she had told me she was going to get a divorce, and I had no doubt that marriage was over. But John, no, he didn't want that. He was resisting, trying to get her back. Yes, David said, there had been real financial problems for them. That and the pressure of living on the farm, but I really think it was the death of her mother. Well, she had decided that life was just too short, and that is not how she wanted to live anymore. ATF investigator Gary Smith asked David if he knew anyone that Donna had been dating, and David said that she had not been in a hurry to get involved with anyone until her divorce was over, but that he knew she had been dating Terry Haynes. No relation, he said. And then a guy named Rod Franciscovich had picked her up at the airport when she returned from Connecticut. I guess you could say she and Rod were seeing each other, and Donna had told me that he wasn't putting any pressure on her and that he was a nice guy. Investigator Smith then asked David where he had been Tuesday night, January 12th, after work, and David said that he and his wife had planned on throwing a party for his father and his youngest son, who was turning one, but that his father could not make it because of the icy roads, adding that he had told Donna about the party, but failed to invite her. No, he said. He'd received no calls from anyone that night. Can you explain to us the circumstances leading up to the discovery of the fire at Donna's residence? Asked Investigator Smith. Tuesday night is when the fire started, said David. Wait, what? Was the look in the two officers' eyes that met, along with that grimace that accompanies a fierce bite of the tongue. So David went through the morning series of events once more, stating, It was not like Donna to arrive late. She was always punctual, he said. Everyone was panicked because she had not arrived at the ATM drop, bags of cash. And then when he called her house, the answering machine picked up, and Donna's voice sounded distorted and slow. Like the machine was melting, he said, stating that the fire was probably already going. Wait, said Special Agent Kedzer. Are you giving us an account of Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning, he asked, somewhat confused. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, remember, the fire was discovered by David on the morning of January 13th, 1993. Wednesday, said David, after we had called the YMCA to see if Donna had dropped off Justine at daycare yet, but she hadn't. My first thought was the divorce. It was then, David stated, I decided to go to her house to check on her. I told my boss, Max Scott, where I was going and why, and I jumped in my truck around 9, 9.15 and drove over there. And when I was pulling into the driveway, I saw a lady coming out of Pauline Newcomb's apartment. No, I didn't recognize her, he said. She was 30, 40 years old, I guess. I parked behind Donna's car, Bonneville, which was in the garage. Yes, the garage door was up. And that's when I saw Justine's car seat in the back. I walked over to her apartment, opened the storm door, and knocked hard. I tried to look around the curtain, but couldn't see anything. The door was large, with big glass. I guess since there was so much smoke, I couldn't see anything. But I checked the door and it was locked and shut solid. I tried to look in another window, but I still could not see anything. That's when I went around to Pauline's and told her I was looking for Donna. 
but she said she didn't know where Donna was, and I asked her if she had a key to the apartment. I think that was before I called the police, but Pauline couldn't find one. Then I called the police and I told them what was going on, and that's when we heard three knocks coming from the wall adjoining Donna's apartment, like someone needed help. I thought maybe she had fallen, and I saw a tiny puff of powder or plaster coming off the wall. And for some reason, I immediately thought that maybe they had been overcome by gas. But what do I know? I don't know anything about gas or fire, David volunteered. He then stated that he ran back to Donna's door and beat on it, to no response, and that that is when he spotted an air conditioner in a window on the south side of the house. He said he took his gloved hands and pulled the unit out, and that smoke began pouring out of the window, that he panicked, and he believed he had tore a piece of metal off the frame of the screen door, and that may have broken a hole in the door's glass with the metal. He said he reached in with his left hand to unlock the door, but he could not feel the deadbolt. So he removed his hand, took off his glove, and tried again, holding up his left index finger for investigators. I burned my fingerprint off, said David, but it's better now. Special Agent Kedzer noted that David's index finger appeared fine and that he could not detect any burn damage. David stated he stepped inside a little bit but could not see anything due to the thick smoke, but that just off to the left, about 12 to 14 feet away against the wall, there was a bright orange ball. It had to be three to four feet tall, said David, and then a fireball shot right towards me, and I could feel it burn my face, my hair and coat, so I got the hell out of there. I had it on my mind that I could get them out, Don and Justine. He stated they had never been to Donna's apartment before, nor seen inside, so I really didn't want to go in, he said. But bedrooms are almost always in the back of a house, which would have been in the east side of Donna's, by the garage. So I broke the south window and yelled inside. He said he had pulled a screen out and could see a bed. I reached in, but I could not feel anyone. David said that he figured he was near the end of the bed, so he decided to break out another window just to the right before reaching in again. The smoke was getting bad, he said. I was creating a draft. And a guy from upstairs came down and broke out one of Pauline's windows. And I asked him what in the hell he was doing. He was making the fire worse. David said that his boss, Max Scott, then arrived. And that he believed Max had told the police who had arrived out front to call the fire department. Max told me after I'd left the bank that he had given Don another call. But said the phone just rang and rang and that the machine never picked up. And then the fire department arrived, and I felt like they were not really doing much. I even asked him to give me an asbestos jacket and some air. Hell, if they weren't going to do anything, I told him I'd go in. David said he tried to give the firemen a layout of the apartment, saying he thought there were two people inside, and that if Donna and Justine were in the room with the glowing dome, then they were already dead. Investigator Smith asked David if the bank was holding the house in a trust, and David said it was, adding, We have the keys, but I don't think we have one of Donna's apartment. Well, I don't know. Maybe I do. And after a brief pause, David continued, stating, If foul play was involved, I sure hope I didn't destroy any evidence. What do you suspect happened? asked Agent Kedzer. I don't know. I suppose I have no reason to suspect anything, he said. As the interview was coming to a close, and the officers were gathering their notes and thanking David for his help, David interrupted, saying, I just want to clarify something I told the fire marshal the other day. Anderson asked Investigator Smith. Yeah, I told him that Donna did not smoke, but since I found out that she does, said David, well, did smoke. At around 2.30 in the afternoon, as the officers put on their gloves and made their way back out into the brisk air, David added, yeah, my brother's house up in Monmouth caught fire back in 92, causing the two officers to make eyes across the roof of the car. The next day, ATF agent Gary Smith and state special agent Kenneth Kedzer met with David once more to inquire whether the bank was in possession of keys to Donna's apartment. David removed four keys from the trust file in his office, and while handing them over stated, I'm not sure if any of these will work, but that's what I have. The officers took a good look and then handed them back to David before leaving the bank empty-handed. Due to the circumstances surrounding the fire, and previous information furnished by David Haynes. Investigators felt it was necessary to re-interview the trust officer. Feeling some of the information he had provided during his initial interviews seemed utterly impossible to have occurred as he had described. So on the following evening, January 21st, Canton Police Sergeant heading up the investigation, David Ayers, called David Haynes up on the phone and asked if he would mind coming up to the police department to answer a few more questions. David agreed, and as he arrived at the station to speak with Sergeant Ayers and State Fire Marshal Ted Anderson, Special Agent Kenneth Kedzer and ATF Investigator Gary Smith made their way out the back door for the Haynes apartment to speak with his wife, Sarah, alone. The art of investigative questioning. Ladies and gentlemen, let's keep in mind some of the tools of investigative questioning, shall we? 
Understand body language. Ask simple questions. Don't show all your cards. Create a kindred bond with your subject. Keep witness interviews on topic and direct. Create the illusion of trust. Don't give up too soon and never forget the power of comfort and civility. At 6.15 p.m., within a small interview room inside the bowels of a single-story, mid-century limestone building that sat atop a slope of land on the corner of First and East Spruce, the interview began as David stated, I know what you're thinking, but I was not involved. In what, asked Sergeant Ayers? The fire at Donna, said David, before explaining yet once again the circumstances which led him to Donna's apartment in the first place and what he had done once he arrived. David's story remained similar to what it had been three times prior. Yet a few new details had emerged. Some elements that investigators knew had happened had been left out, and David could not remember others they felt were invaluable and unforgettable. David had first stated that he could not remember if he had a glove on when he broke the window in the door and reached in to unlock the deadbolt, but now stated that when doing so he had lost his glove, and suddenly he fails to recall feeling any heat nor seeing any flames or smoke when he had previously claimed to have endured upon first entering the front door a blast of fire. He also does not remember looking into the crack in the curtain, and officers noted that if David had truthfully done so, he should have seen the fire burning inside. When questioned again if he had observed any fire just inside the door, he said, No, I only took two or three steps. Was this after you removed the air conditioner from the window? asked Sergeant Ayers. It was, said David, again describing the smoke that rolled out of the window. Very heavy in columns, two differently colored columns, as he pointed at one of the chairs in the interview room, continuing. One was that color, gray, the other black. I'd never seen anything like it, he said. Fire Marshal Anderson then asked, Tell me again. What happened when you first opened that front door? Well, I walked in and I could see an orange glow across the room, said David. All right, said Anderson. What I'd like to know, given what you told me about the columns of smoke rolling out the window, I need to tell you that smoke in a house fire stays relatively constant height throughout the residence. And the air conditioner, well, it was no more than 24 inches off the floor. The way I see it, David, can I call you Dave? The way I see it, Dave, the way you describe things, the moment you opened the door, you should have been knocked over by a cloud of smoke or blown out from a backdraft, and you would have at least had to have been on your knees to see this so-called glowing red dome. There would have had to have been less smoke, he said, as he stood and threw up a hand. Look, I've been doing this for a long time, Dave, trust me, less smoke, or I have to say you did not actually walk into that house. Did you, Dave? I guess not, said David. I suppose maybe I didn't actually enter the apartment. So you didn't actually walk into the house, asked Anderson. Tell me, is there anything else you did or didn't do that we should know about? No, of course not, said David. As Fire Marshal Anderson looked deep into his eyes, believing that David had just realized he was caught changing his story, and that this was something that David certainly did not want to do. Honesty and truthfulness are not the same thing, it is said. Being honest means not telling lies. Being truthful means actively making known all the full truth of a matter. Lawyers must be honest, but they do not have to be truthful. Was David Haynes one such lawyer? Honest, yet not truthful? In addition, studies have long shown that when reading or hearing a story, people seek to identify the casual and motivational forces that drive the interactions of characters and link events, thereby achieving explanatory coherence. In other words, the tendency to bend the facts to fit a convenient and preferred narrative. And detectives have a long history of forcing fabrications to become truth when wanting to solve a crime, when wanting to appease a prosecutor, when wanting to get a guilty verdict. Oftentimes, they find themselves trying to smash a round peg into a square hole. Was Fire Marshal Anderson one such investigator? The State Fire Marshal's motto to train like it's real. Why? Because the state fire marshal was primarily responsible for fire training, teaching, and thus mastering every aspect of the nature of combustion and prevention. This fire was intentionally set, said Anderson, attempting to surprise David. We know that flammable liquids have been poured inside the apartment and intentionally set on fire, he said, careful not to make any mention as to where the liquids were poured. Do you know what I'm talking about, Dave? I don't, said David. I don't know anything about that. 
I don't know anything about any flammable liquids or how the fire started. I told you everything I know and everything I saw. Everything happened just as I explained, I told you. Did you set the fire, Dave? No, of course not. Of course I didn't set the fire. Dave, it is in our opinion that you are not telling the truth about what you did or saw that morning. And as Anderson took a seat and scooted his chair closer to the now quite flustered interviewee, he said, And Dave, what's this you told the insurance investigator? Something about if we find a fingerprint on the deadbolt, it's yours? Why would you say that? None of this adds up, Dave. Look, that's what happened. I opened the door and everything I told you is true, said David, as Sergeant Ayers noted a rash breaking out from David's neck to his forehead. Fire Marshal Anderson continued to drill David, believing that though he did not want to retract a false statement, what David was claiming was utterly ridiculous. It's no big deal, said Anderson. Just admit it. It didn't go down this way, did it? I mean, it's impossible. Can't you see it, Dave? It's impossible. I don't understand why you would not just save yourself some trouble and tell us the truth. David just shook his head, and Anderson took an exacerbated breath, shook his own head, and gathered his notes in frustration. He then stood and exited the room. And once the door clicked shut, David turned to Sergeant Ayers and said, The only thing I can think of is that maybe when I tried to call Donna from the bank, the answer machine had set off some kind of booby trap. Or maybe when I walked in, I kicked over a container with accelerant in it. Ayers noted that at no time had anyone mentioned the word accelerant, only flammable liquid. Nor was there any mention of accelerants being poured just inside the door. At 7.05 p.m., David asked if he could use the restroom and get a cup of coffee, and no doubt let his heart rate slow. And at 8.05 p.m., David re-entered the room, where Special Agent Kenneth Kedzer, who had just returned from speaking with Sarah Haynes, unbeknownst to David's knowledge, had joined Sergeant Ayers. When Agent Kedzer informed David that Anderson had left for the evening, Sergeant Ayers noticed that the rash from David's neck had all but disappeared, as he took a relieved breath and settled into his chair. I just want to say I didn't do this, said David. I wasn't involved in any way. I didn't set the fire. I didn't kill Donna. I didn't kill Justine. And I know you don't really believe I did this, do you? The officers remained silent. Look, I know you don't really believe I did it. I know you're just doing your job, said David, repeating continuously that he wanted to help solve the case in any way he could. Reiterating, I know you don't really believe I did anything wrong. You're just doing your jobs. How did you know that Justine's bed was located along the east side of the house, asked Agent Kedzer. I didn't, said David, but I was in the apartment about one month before they moved in. You were never in the residence while Donna and Justine were living there, he was asked. Never, said David. Look, how much longer is this going to take? I need to call my wife. And at 9.42 p.m., David used the restroom again, got a fresh cup of coffee, called his wife Sarah, and learned from her that Special Agent Kenneth Kedzer had just been there interviewing her. And when David returned to the interview room, he was now irritated and noticed that Sergeant Ayers had been replaced by ATF agent Gary Smith. What game is this, he asked himself. Agent Kedzer reinstated the interview at 9.51 as David immediately began to deny any involvement once again with the fire or the deaths of Donna and Justine. Look, I know you're just doing your jobs, he said. There is no way you actually believe I do something like this. I mean, I really want to help you guys and I will do anything I can. I'd love to help solve this and find out who did it as much as you. I'll do anything I can to get to the bottom of it. I mean, I want to solve this, figure out who did it, you know? Anything I can do, just let me know. I'd be more than happy to help. I mean, I'm sure I can help. I'm an observant guy. I'm usually pretty aware of everything going on around me. For example, on Tuesday, I noticed that Donna was in a bad mood. She even snapped at my boss, Max Scott. She was really disrespectful to him. And then later that day, she came to me complaining about Joanne calling into work. Joanne had been sick that day, so that meant extra duties for Donna. And she was going to miss a dentist appointment or something like that, David continued. The investigators were getting no further with David, and they decided to conclude the interview at 10.48 p.m. So how did our investigators do? It was concluded that the information and details he had provided did not conform with the circumstances found and revealed by the fire scene. And all the investigators who worked the actual fire scene had agreed that Donna's account of what he saw simply could not have occurred as he explained. And as David exited the room, Sergeant Ayers approached him to thank him, asking him within the confinement of a firm handshake if he'd be willing to submit to a polygraph examination conducted by the Illinois State Police. Um, I don't, I don't think I'm really interested in doing that, said David. No, I don't want to do that. At least not until I speak with some people. I can't promise you anything. And at 11.10 p.m., David exited the O'Brien Public Safety Building 
climbed into his mustard yellow Toyota pickup that cranked over slowly in the bitter chill of the night and drove the half block home to his awaiting wife Sarah and their two young children who lied soundly asleep, peaceful and safe in their beds, prayers still aloft in the furnace dried air. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. May God guard me through the night and wake me with the morning's light. Amen. I'm Corey Zimmerman, and this is Spoon River Gothic. Gothic is a production of Lone Bird Media in association with CZ Studio and Radio Verite. The show is produced by August Olson, editing, directing, and producing by Corey Zimmerman, audio mastering and engineering by E. Mastered. Research is done by Anne Marie Cannon, Chelsea Mesa, and me, Jinra Illustrisimo. Spoon River Gothic is written and hosted by Corey Zimmerman. You can follow the show at czstudio.works and read the blog at spoonrivergothic.com. Show some love by leaving us a rating or review on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And stay tuned for the next episode as we dive deeper into the Donald Bull case. Thank you for listening. This is Spoon River Gothic, narrative of a double homicide.